So now we're going to come in from uh, the exoplanets and we're going to do a deep dive into Earth deep time yep. and talk about complex life. This is Ross Anderson, another Oxford colleague, and I will bellow it two minutes. Great. Thank you very much. So just for everybody's um, information, I'm actually a paleontologist, so this is quite a unique crowd uh, for me to give giving a talk in. But um, if we take a look at our planet from space, you know, it's quite clear that our planet has life on it. The continent you see here is covered in green. And that reflects the fact that land plants are all over our planet's surface. Land plants, like animals, including ourselves, are complex life. They're not bacteria and archaea. They're members of a group called the eukaryotes, which are defined by the fact their cells have a nucleus or membrane-bounded organelles, things like the chloroplast mitochondria. And if you think about our planet today, our planet is dominated by eukaryotes. If you look at the biosphere, eukaryotes account for most biomass. They account for most documented biodiversity. And they account for most primary productivity. They're key players in our planet today. But it hasn't always been this way. If we roll back the clock in Earth's history over 500 million years ago, our planet was undergoing a major re revolution. We were going from a planet which only had bacteria and archaea to one which had this complex life. And it's this question, when and why did eukaryotes first diversify on Earth, which occupies my mind a lot. It's what, what I work on. But I think it's also really important for the astrobiological community because it informs this question. In what environments might eukaryotes diversify elsewhere across the universe? So as a paleontologist, I go back in time and I look at fossils, unsurprisingly, to figure out how eukaryotes first evolved on our planet. This is the geological time scale on the top, the present is on the right, and we're going back in time through millions of years. And what you can see is if you, I, I think most people in the room would think about a fossil, they'd think about a dinosaur or a trilobite or an ammonite. All those things come from the last 10% of Earth's history. But the fossil record goes back deeper. The rise of eukaryotes, we think, happened about a billion to 500 million years ago. This is when eukaryotes really became dominant in the biosphere. And we have fossils which can tell us about what was going on. We have single-celled eukaryotes 1.6, 1.7 billion years ago. We have examples of algae, and we even have in the Ediacara biota across the world, including here in the UK, in Leicestershire, we have examples of the first animals. But this is a pretty broad view of things, and there are still huge outstanding questions that we don't understand about Earth's early history. We don't know the pace and the order in which di eukaryotes diversified into major groups, so we don't know the time scale. We don't know when red algae or green algae or fungi first emerged. And because we don't have a robust time scale, that means we also find it really difficult to make correlations to environmental changes. We can't say whether oxygen caused the rise of eukaryotes or whether big climatic events like Snowball Earth, which I put up here, which happened over this interval, what, what influence did they have on this revolution? We don't know because we don't yet have that precise, robust time scale. So what's the problem? What's the real stumbling block in this research? Well, if we think about the fossil record as you probably, most of you would recognize it, most of the things you think about are hard, they have skeletons or shells, and they're big, right? Whereas if we're going back in time, things don't have shells and skeletons, and they're all really small. And that means it's really difficult for them to be preserved. And we don't yet know the precise conditions, the precise chemical conditions in a sediment which lead to their preservation. And I think this, this slide here really lays the problem bare. If we go back further than 600 million years ago, there are really only five fossils which are preserved well enough with enough morphological details that we can say, yes, this is a particular group of eukaryotes. Five. So when we say we know huge amounts about early life on Earth, we don't actually, right? We're really stumbled by the amount of data that we have. 
So a lot of my work here in Oxford over the last few years and work in my lab has really been focused on trying to understand what are the conditions that lead to the preservation of early eukaryotes. Because if we can understand that and take a step back and do that, do that you know, groundwork, we're going to have a be much better idea of where to go look for these fossils. And we're also going to know how the record is structured. How is it biased? Where are we missing data? So today, what I want to do in our talk is really talk about two stories. One is how we're working on the chemistry to actually refine the search image. And I'm going to talk a lot about how clay minerals might be really important to preservation. And then I'm going to talk about how we can test that search image. So can we use the search image that we've created, take it out to the field, and find new fossils? Does it work? So we'll begin with the clay organic interactions. So if we think about where we find early fossils, um, the most common repository on Earth, 75% of assemblages with early fossils, regardless of what we, what we might think they are, come from rocks between two and a half and half a billion years old, and those rocks are mudstones. So they're rocks that used to be muddy sediment, essentially. This is a, a variety of fossils that you can f recover from these deposits. But we know mudstones are a really common lithology on our planet. They're a really common rock type. They're across the Earth's surface. So we need to know what makes one mudstone more likely to preserve a fossil than another. It's like looking for a tiny needles in a very big haystack. We need to circle in on the needles if we can. So it turns out there's actually been quite a lot of work in the paleontological uh, research on how mudstones preserve early fossils. And a huge variety of ideas have been put forward. But what's interesting is that one factor, the mineralogy of the rock that you preserve these fossils in, comes up multiple times. So sediment composition is, has, been shown, has been suggested to be important. If your rock is rich in clays, maybe those clays change the permeability of the rock or have properties that are toxic to bacteria. And also, perhaps, clay minerals can actually precipitate onto your organic substrate, forming some kind of protective layer. So I became really interested in clays and, and mineralogy, and I started to think a little bit about this in more detail. And so what we did back in 2016 was we grew a type of bacterium, a heterotrophic bacterium that decays marine animals today in the oceans. We grew it in different sediments. And this is a, a chart here on the y-axis. You've got low growth on the bottom, high growth on the top. And what you can see is that different minerals had different effects on the growth of this bacterium. And in particular, the iron-rich clay berthrine and the aluminium-rich clay kaolinite really suppressed the growth of this uh, bacterium. And this was quite exciting, because it suggested maybe if your rock was full of these iron and aluminium-rich clays, maybe you've got a chance of crashing the bacterial population and preserving your fossil. But the question was, do rocks that have these excellent fossils, do they have this mineralogy. So we went to the Cambrian, so 500 million years ago, and we looked at rocks that either had, that all had fossils. So we knew life was around and living, organisms were living and dying in those places. But we compared rocks where you only had hard tissues preserved, things like trilobites or brachiopods, to ones that had soft tissues. So you got the other soft components of those organisms preserved. And what you see here, is on the y-axis, we've got the probability of finding soft tissue fossils. And on the x-axis is the percentage of the rock which is composed of your minerals. And what we found was a, some really stark relationships. So we found that if, you have, if your rock is composed of a lot of illite, you've basically got no chance of preserving these early fossils. But interestingly, if your rock is composed of berthrine, the more berthrine you have, the better the chance you have of preserving fossils. If you've got more than 20% berthrine in your rock, you basically guarantee that that rock is going to preserve these cool fossils. So that was really exciting, because if we go back to the experiments, berthrine was one of those minerals that actually suppressed the growth of the bacterium. So we've got a mechanistic, a, a potential link here, where you've got a mechanism, the mineral is toxic to the bacteria that are doing decay, and that mineral is showing up in the rocks that preserve these cool fossils. We took this a bit further more recently, and we looked at, um, more broadly, microfossils across the, the Proterozoic and their, and their preservation quality. So this is really looking at whether your 
um, the probability of you having really nice fossils, um, but on a broader array of stuff, not just the most exceptional deposit. And we found, actually, a slightly different relationship. We found that the amount of clay in your rock was still important, but perhaps specific minerals were not. And actually, we had a negative relationship with berthrine, which was quite surprising. But I think what this suggests is that there are grades of preservation. The really exceptional stuff, that stuff where you've got all different kinds of organic matter preserved, you need the minerals of the specific type because we need that toxicity effect, of the bacteria. But if you've got organisms where you've just got cellulose cell walls, so quite resistant biopolymers, you might not only need clay of any type that just has a kind of permeability effect on the rock. So both these types of clays are going to have permeability effects, but only one is going to be toxic to the bacteria. So if we think a bit more about that exceptional kind of preservation, we can zoom in and look at where those minerals are. And this is a fossil that we've cut across with a focus ion beam, extracted a section. So we've got the fossil here in black in the center. And what you can see is directly around the fossil, you've got platy clay forming a little halo. This is your clay mineral. This is the kaolinite, a precursor of berthrine. And it's actually binding directly and forming this halo around the fossils, protecting them. So I think this, is really, this set of results is really exciting because it, says, it suggests that clays are really important to exceptional preservation, and they might help us to search systematically for these fossils for the first time, actually narrow down our search image. So for the second part of the talk, what I want to do is actually go and test this image. You know, can we use that clay-rich search image to find cool fossils in the Precambrian? So this is Svalbard in the Arctic, has rocks that are about a billion years old, they're all on their side here, so you go from the oldest rocks over there to the youngest rocks on this side. Um, and the rocks are from this uh, group of rocks called the Veteranen Group. Now, this, this, this set of suite of rocks is five kilometers thick, and it's mostly mudstones. That's a huge amount of rock to go look in for these tiny fossils. So we've got a bit of a problem, right? We need to uh, narrow down our search image. So using our clay, what we can do is we can go look through these rocks and say how much clay is in the rock. And we get a variety of, of uh, percentages. And then what we can do is we can start to work back from the highest. So we look for fossils in the highest uh, clay abundance first and work our way back. Now, we've only done this for a fraction of those samples on there so far, maybe 20% uh, you know, or so of those samples. So we've not got very far down into this clay abundance. And there's already cool fossils. OK? This is. Uh, uh, probably a red algae, uh, early seaweed. It's the oldest organism to have symmetry in the fossil record. Nothing like this has been known before. So it shows that we can recover fossils with really delicate morphologies, morphologies that we can use to pinpoint where these things are on, on the tree of life. Thank you. So this is, this is just some of the, the developmental data that we can get from that fossil. Actually, really exciting biological results. It can tell us about how these early algae already had the developmental capacity of modern algae today, very early in their evolution. So using this search image, we can get fossils that actually tell us a huge amount about early evolution. So going forward, what is the, the future of this, this area? How can we really advance thinking about early life? So I want to return to this image. We are limited at the moment by the number of fossils we have. And it's about narrowing down that search image and knowing where to look. And I think or what I hope I've shown you over the course of the last 20 minutes is that if by taking a step back and thinking about that preservation, we can actually really narrow down for the first time and be systematic in our search, much more efficient. And I think it's the perfect time to be doing this kind of research. Um, out of Stanford recently is a new database called the Sedimentary Geochemistry and Paleoenvironments Project. Very long name. But what this is is basically a database of geochemical data from the early Earth. And there are tens of thousands of samples now in this database. What this means is we can go in and we can mine it and say, which of these successions that have been looked at for chemistry would be good places to go look at for fossils? You know, it's giving us the ability to go target specific time intervals. 
And I hope that we can, will eventually get much more resolution on this diagram, be able to put the fossils in their geological context, understand which environments they evolved in, how their habitats changed through time, and that is going to be really critical for thinking about how complex life might have emerged on other planets. You know, Earth is our only, at the moment, our N equals one example. So we've got to make the most of it. And I just want to finish with uh, this. This is a picture from the Perseverance uh, rover from uh, Jezero Crater. And the reason why Perseverance landed in Jezero Crater is because from orbital data, we were able to show that it, the Jezero Crater had clay minerals. Those minerals that I've just told you are really important for preservation. So I think it can really highlight where we should go look on other planets and other planetary bodies for life in the universe. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. And turn over to the next one. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.